Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today in the Let's Talk About series presented to you by uh, the Juno Suicide Prevention Coalition and NAMI Juno. Uh, we've had a, a month-long series of wonderful conversations and um, our conversations are, are meant to connect our community uh, with critical resources during our time and just everyday life. Uh, to take stigma out of suicide and to uh, promote mental health. And we are recognizing this as the September, as the Juno, or excuse me, as the Suicide Prevention Month. Um, so some of the conversations that we've had, if you've missed them, uh, this week were family healing after suicide and postvention, advocating for mental health at a state level. We had Sarah Hannon with us. Thank you, Sarah, for that. Um, we had what is peer-to-peer -peer support and its benefits and stories of recovery from veterans and active duty members. Uh, if you missed those or any of them from the weeks prior, uh, these conversations are being recorded um, on will be available again on YouTube. Please share them with your loved ones. And uh, today we have with us from SAIL, Southeast Alaska uh, Independent Living. We have with us Tristan Knudsen Lombardo and Tracy Lee. Um, they will introduce themselves and give us a, a wonderful conversation on seven things you should know about brain injury. I'm looking really forward to that conversation. And then one last housekeeping message is that this conversation is on the Zoom link is uh, available in closed captioning in order to um, have that come up on your screen. On the bottom, there is a closed captioning button. Thank you, there we go. So we can uh, just click that on and we'll be able to see it. The other thing that um, I want to share is uh, if you have questions, there's, in, there's questions, there's a Q&A box as well as the chat box. Um, please ask your questions. Uh, throughout and we will answer them as they come and so that we're not straying too far away from it. All right and I thank you. I want to thank you uh, Tristan and Tracy for being with us today and I will just hand this over to you Tristan. Thanks Tina. Thanks for the uh, invitation. Yes my name uh, is Tristan Knutson Lombardo. I am uh, the assistant director with SAIL and I'll let uh, Tracy introduce herself. And my name is Tracy Lee and I am an um, IL advocate for sale uh, as one of my hats, but I also run uh, two uh, peer support groups for people with traumatic brain in or acquired brain injuries. And uh, we also have a wonderful veteran program that I am happy to be a part of helping people uh, get help for their loved ones to be able to stay home longer. Um, wow. yeah. Today we uh, are going to, as Tina mentioned, talk about um, brain injuries. And we said seven things to know, but in reality, we're probably gonna talk a lot about a lot more than just seven things uh, because uh, brain injuries are, are very wide and varied and um, are really unique to the person that experiences them. So. We'll talk about um, where Alaska sits as far as brain injuries and statistics, how to identify a brain injury, um, preventing them, the connection to mental health, um, and then supports and, and resources. Before we go too far, though, I, I would like to just give a quick overview of SAIL, who we are, our services. Um, Southeast Alaska Independent Living, we are um, uh, Southeast Alaska's Aging and Disability Resource Center. We're also a center for independent living. So that means that we serve folks with disabilities as well as seniors. Um, any age, any disability, um, people can come uh, to us. We're a, a resource, a place of support, creative thinking. Um, we have offices throughout Southeast Alaska. Juno's our main one, um, but we also have offices in Sitka, Ketchikan, Haines, Klawak, 
We have um, partnerships with uh, the tribes in Cake and Yakutat uh, with some part-time staff there as well. Um, and then if you live in a smaller community or a community where we don't have an office, um, in normal times, we'd be traveling there to do outreach, but we still are, are working to support people wherever they are in Southeast Alaska. Our mission is to inspire personal independence, and we really believe that um, seniors, elders, folks with disabilities, uh, we know what's best for our own lives, and we really want to support people in those decisions. Independence looks different for everybody. And so when people come to our door, we really want to hear their story, um, listen to what goals they have, what barriers they're facing uh, in, that, in their goals for independence, and then work with them to achieve that. Um, we provide a wide range of services, um, and I'll probably forget some of the things that we do. Um, we, a lot of people know us through um, uh, our taxi voucher program. We partner with a cab company in Juneau and Ketchikan to provide accessible 24-7 um, cab rides in the community. We have a loan closet of durable medical equipment and assistive technology. Um, as Tracy mentioned, uh, we have support groups uh, for brain injuries, low vision, deaf, hard of hearing. Um, we, uh, a lot of folks know us through our recreation program, ORCA, Adapt uh, Outdoor Recreation and Community Access. So year round, um, getting folks uh, out of their house outdoors, making the outdoors accessible um, to people no matter their age or disability. Um, we also just do, as, as Tracy mentioned, she's an independent living advocate. We just, we also work with people one-on-one -on -one to achieve their goals for independence. And that looks different for everybody, whether it's accessible housing, employment, um, you know, whatever those goals are, we try, try to work with people. And if we can't provide the service, we work hard to figure out who our community partners um, are that we can work together to help meet those needs. Um, one of the uh, last thing I'll say, one of the things that I really love about SAIL and I think is really unique is that we, 51% um, of our staff and our board of directors and decision makers, um, it's a mandate, are people who experience a disability. Um, and so independent living is a, has a long history as a civil rights movement, um, a disability rights movement, and um, centers for independent living across the country try to model that, that it's, um, nothing about us without us, that it's uh, people with disabilities uh, working alongside um, people with disabilities. So that's uh, something that's unique about SAIL and I think um, is one of the things I always like to share because people don't often realize that. Um, Kristen, I yeah. just want to say how amazing that is. I don't believe that I realize the extent of your services um, and I I hope that you'll put in the chat box what your website is and how do we get in contact with you? Um, you know, and, and I'm sure if we go to the website, then we will see all of the, the support groups that you were talking about, as well as uh, the veteran groups and what an amazing outreach you have. And, and yeah. I also, that, that knowing that independence looks different for everybody and your uh, inclusivity in, in um, how it is that you you staff or your policies and your board of directors is just remarkable. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. Yeah, thank you. We'll definitely put that information in there. And um, uh, you know, as a as a center for independent living, we are we're, we are required to serve people of any disability. Um, and so when we were invited to come talk today, we thought, gosh, um, brain, the connection between brain injuries and mental health is really um, a strong link and, and connection and um, it deserved probably some attention. Um, and so, uh, Tracy, I don't know if you, uh, maybe I'll jump in and do a little bit of statistics um, for Alaska and then, um, but you know, Alaska, we have the highest rate of brain injuries um, in the country. Um, you know, the Rough statistics are six to 800 um, hospitalizations a year occur in Alaska because of a brain injury, um, typically a, a, a traumatic kind of event um, lands somebody in the hospital. Um, uh, our high rate is attributed to a lot of things. We have 
um, we, the industry that people work in, um, a lot of blue collar outdoor work that can be risky or dangerous. Our weather creates um, opportunities for brain injuries. Um, the way we like to recreate and be outside um, also creates opportunities for um, uh, acquiring a brain injury. Um, you know, we have a lot of um, military armed services um, uh, personnel which that can also result or, or increase your risk of acquiring a brain injury. Um, and then one that people don't often think about, but we have um, disproportionately high rates of violence in our state and violent um, acts can result certainly in, in a multitude of disabilities, including brain injury. And so um, all of those factors mean that Alaska, um, we, we have a really high rate of brain injuries. And despite that high rate, we are one of the states with the fewest resources available uh, to address, diagnose, support people, prevent brain injuries. Um, most states in the U.S. have some sort of rehab center or program for brain injuries. Alaska doesn't. And so um, when you think about the disconnect between how the high occurrence of brain injuries in our state and then the, the low number of resources, we certainly have um, a lot of catching up to do. And, and hopefully presentations and conversations like this will help kind of um, move the needle and, and connect the dots. But um, I think Tracy, you're gonna talk maybe a little bit about what does a brain injury look like? Right, and, and really it depends. Um, sometimes you can see it with people, but mostly you can't. Um, and we were um, gonna kind of look at the difference between a, a traumatic brain injury versus acquired brain injury. Um, and the, this is, uh, let me find this here for you. See if I can share this. Well, we'll just go with this. So, um, and you're wondering what what con constitutes an acquired brain injury? Well, um, these are things like if somebody's had a stroke, or um, if something happens like. Um, very common and um, we find when people get older diseases like Alzheimer's, uh, Parkinson's, Huntington's dementia, these are things uh, considered an acquired brain injury. Um, you could have complications from surgery. Some kind of trauma in your life can affect the brain, seizures, um, tumors, uh, infections or alcohol or toxins brought into the body can actually have lasting um, damage to the brain. Uh, hypoxia or anoxia, the lack of oxygen, um, and like people who have maybe uh, had drowning accidents um, or other I, things that happen to them, uh, aneurysms, many things like that. Um, when we look at um, other types of traumatic brain injuries, um, mostly we can do our best and we will be talking about this later, but how do you protect yourself a little bit more? Um, we have um, people that uh, we've worked with that have done everything that they, thought they would be to protect themselves, especially when um, skiing or riding a motorcycle or anything like that. Um, and the sad thing is that uh, they still did everything right and had, had a brain injury, but if they hadn't been wearing that helmet, um, it wouldn't have been a very good story. Um, Many times, uh, I, we actually have a person that has joined one of our um, support groups recently, and he gave us a very good visual. He held up his helmet. Um, he was riding a motorcycle, and to avoid a deer, um, had a really bad crash, and that helmet was in pieces. But he survived, and... He is now working through the process 
of how to deal with his brain injury. And that's why we really like having um, support groups where people can share their experiences. It's a safe place and people can compare um, how different or how similar things can happen. Um, and that's the other thing that's kind of being more noticed um, these days with sports related, especially with youth these days, uh, football injuries, um, other sports injuries. And, you know, a lot of times people say, you know, shake it off. But um, a lot of times we don't really realize what is going on in the brain. And we will also be talking about how to kind of uh, notice what's going on if somebody has had a little accident, you know, things to look for. All right, we'll go to the next one, Tristan. Sure. So we've talked about one, Alaska has a really high rate of brain injury occurrence. Two, what, what does a brain injury look like? They can be traumatic, they can be acquired. Um, there's many different ways we don't even think about how we can, um, how damage can occur to our brain. Our third point um, is the connection between brain injury and um, mental health. And uh, there was a recent study funded, there's actually a lot of studies that talk about the connection between mental health and brain injury. Um, for example, last summer, a study came out from the National Institutes of Health and they looked at um, the occurrence of traumatic injuries, both orthopedic and then also um, traumatic brain injuries. Um, so injuries orthopedic that involve other parts of the body, like say a broken bone or, you know, in the leg or something, and then those that occurred in the brain. Those that occurred in the brain, were, those individuals were 20 to 25% more likely to experience significant mental health um, um, kind of consequences, uh, PTSD, um, major depressive disorders, anxiety, um, as a result of um, both the experience and the lasting effects, the lingering effects through recovery. So there's a really strong link connection between uh, an injury that occurs and then how we support somebody um, in that recovery process. And we can do more, I shouldn't say we do more damage, but perhaps um, by not providing the right supports and services to help somebody as they navigate their new life with a new injury, a new disability, um, we only um, magnify the impacts that it has on somebody's mental health as they're struggling to understand themselves and also be understood. Like Tracy said, um, oftentimes brain injuries are not noticeable just by looking at somebody. And so, um, so the connection between mental health is, is, is strong. Yes, and I wanna just add, um, you know, we have a number of people uh, that are just kind of coming to know. And, and I even have my own story where, um, yes, I've had some brain injuries in my life. Like when I was in college, I fell off a horse and got amnesia for a day, those kind of things. I, I think our brains are so resilient a lot of times that um, they create new pathways. We just become a different type of learner depending on what part of our brain has been damaged. Um, and, um, you know, this is kind of an interesting piece that's more, um, you know, looking at mental health and what are the lasting effects. When you struggle with a brain injury, uh, and many people don't even realize that maybe something more happened. And, and that was something for me uh, about four years ago. I, I had another fall that was pretty significant, but I just had to brush myself off. I, <laughs> it's kind of a funny story. Um, my husband was backing a vehicle into our yard. We were doing a project where, with a roofing project. Um, and we had a tarp, a large tarp across the front and it was wet, like Juno can be, and the tires were kind of spinning a little as he was trying to get closer to the area he was going. And I'm, I'm actually far out of the way. I'm watching this process. And I was looking at the tarp. I was looking at the truck. And I said, well, 
I wonder what's going to happen when he gets to that tarp because it's slick, you know. And I found out because little did I realize I'm standing on the tarp where I was across on the side of the yard. And um, when that hit that, it the velocity of the spinning wheels really had a lot of force and that basically pulled my feet out from under me. I went flying backwards, um, hit my head on the ground. Um, and these are the other injuries that people don't think about, like with car accidents and things like that. Uh, you think you're damaging that piece of your brain to the back, but you get that uh, effect of bouncing around. So you can also work on um, hitting different, working different parts of your brain, like your uh, frontal lobe. And so, like I said, I just kind of brushed it off. I, I did maybe the next day go to the doctor. Oh, you have had a concussion, you know, just take it easy. But I did not want to make that the, I was so focused at that time in my life on what I had to do. I had some big responsibilities at the time. Um, and I just pushed through, but I realized later as I, uh, experienced more loss here with short term memory, things like that, that I was in denial and I did fall into more of, uh, a depression, things like that, that were, um, until I really looked at this with some people I was working with, the, um, actually we'll, we'll be talking about the Alaska Brain Injury Network. They, they have been coming uh, to town a few times to help people um, that just need to have a screening of what has happened, you know, if they think they have had any, a brain injury. Um, and I, I feel very fortunate that I have worked through this. It's been some time and really understand a little bit more about what has happened to me and where I struggle, but there are ways to help. And, and that's where I love to be part of that, where I work now is that everything that I've learned, I can share. And then the people that I work with that come to us with our support groups, we are just a great sharing group and caring people, um, especially when somebody's new to that. So um, we'll definitely provide that information as well. Um, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Tracy. Um, I have, I do have a, a question to ask. Uh, so you, you put it off uh, and that's something I would do. I, I just, you know, I, if you don't make me go, I'm not going, right? And then once I get there, um, my question is uh, like, what am I looking for to know if I need to go in, um, you know, to, to see a doctor? And then the other is, does our, medical community, will they just automatically run the screen that you're asking if you tell them, I mean, you're not bleeding, there's no lumps and all of that. Are they, are they going to, um, are they going to go as deep as maybe should be necessary or do we need to advocate for ourselves? And if that's the case, how do we do that? Uh, it, you know, that is actually one of the slides that we do have coming up, but I can go right into that. Actually, we can we'll go right to that. And that is, you know, how to recognize a brain injury. Um, you know, anytime you have some type of a, a hit or a blow to the head and have some type of, you know, oh, I just got my bell rung. I don't know. Um, especially if there's an alteration of your consciousness, if you've lost consciousness or those kind of things. The other thing um, that you have to really think about, if that was enough of a hit, it's always a good idea to, to go to the doctor um, because you may have a brain bleed that you're, you, you wouldn't know about, um, things like that, blurred vision. Um, if you're looking at somebody and they have uh, issues with their, like their eyes are very dilated or their pupils are uneven, confusion, even nausea, um, it's definitely a good idea to get right to the uh, emergency room in those cases. Um, but uh, it's one of those things that we're always looking at, uh, okay, is this enough to go? But even if you're feeling, you know, okay, I'm not too bad, get to the doctor, hopefully in the next day or so, 
and they can assess the situation. Um, Tris and I were talking a little bit more earlier about, unfortunately, um, you know, our doctors aren't always as um, well versed in what to look for sometimes we have sometimes it's like only if something is really blaring at them um but you know that's the thing is um you're gonna see sometimes some little longer um lasting things like um uh, okay memory is short-term memory you're having a lot of difficulties um sensory overload like um lighting uh, one of the biggest things that people complain about that that I know um, that have suffered brain injuries in the past, uh, going to Fred Meyer and being in there a long time because of the lighting in certain stores, it just, it does something to people. It just makes them very uncomfortable. They can't think. Um, they get really fatigued easily. Um, and this can be the same for many sensory things, sounds, um, and, uh, you know, as you get to, like we say, every brain injury is different. Um, so yes, it's, um, it's a tricky one because it's, you know, you kind of have to look for those signs and decide at what level, um, you need to get to the doctor, but it's always better to err on the side of caution when you have a head injury. Well, and, and like Tina, like you asked, do we need to advocate for ourselves? Absolutely. The other thing Tracy and I were talking about earlier was that often the traditional medical model falls well short of supporting people with brain injuries because if it, like Tracy said, if it doesn't appear super obvious that somebody has a brain injury, but, but you yourself know if something is different that has shifted for you, then something doesn't feel right and, and you deserve to have you know, be supported in, in figuring that out. I know, you know, Tracy and I were talking about um, the different uh, therapists and specialists that can help you navigate a brain injury and recover. So utilizing physical therapy, speech therapy, occupational therapy, um, you should certainly ask your medical provider about those. Um, talking about your, your diet and the connection between um, our gut health and our brain health um, are absolutely connected and, and taking a step back and being able to look at the kind of the holistic picture of, of our brains. Um, uh, as Tracy said, when we're chatting, our brain is connected to our body and our body is connected to our brain. And so they have to, in tandem, work together and, and um, we have to treat them as such. And so, um, and, and a lot of times it does take, it, it is absolutely take advocacy. And that's something that sale that we will we are are here to work with folks on is helping them navigate these different systems and, and resources and, and being an advocate with them. Great. Thank you for that. I'm I see a question that's come up, and again, you might be covering this, uh, but one of our um, one of our viewers is asking how can community mental health services like support groups become more accessible to folks with injuries or other related disabilities? I, I think that's a great question. I think one is for many, in, in my experience, and Tracy, you can certainly speak to yours, the folks that we've worked with at SAIL, um, the mental health component, it, it might be secondary to their other, so maybe their primary disability, the thing they're really focused on isn't about their mental health. Um, but in fact, it is all, it is a real tangible part for them. And it's, um, and it is, it is working and acting in concert with whatever else is going on. And I, and I think for us to just broaden the, the, the lens of, um, you know, for example, yes, if, if you experience a dramatic brain injury, um, but you also, it could be available to you, a, a mental health support group, because you are struggling with your mental health as well, or it's been a really challenging time, and, and you might enjoy that support in, in, in that way as well. Um, the other thing I, I think, and, and SAIL has shifted this, we've responded, but a lot of our support groups are meeting during the daytime, 
And if you work a job, um, or maybe they're at lunchtime, and if you have a nine to five job and you're like, I don't want to spend my lunch hour at a support group, I want to spend my lunch hour eating lunch, <laughs> then, um, then having groups that meet at different times uh, of the day, the weekend even, um, it's just nice depending on people's personal schedules and, and flexibility. The last thing I'll, I'll add is um, that um, in this time of everything being on Zoom and on screens, particularly for folks with brain injuries, it's really hard to be on the screen for a long time. And support groups that used to be meeting in person that are now meeting virtually, um, uh, if, if, if sensory overload and screens um, don't work well with your, your brain, then that's, it just is one more barrier, one more um, level of being removed um, and, and losing that support. Um, certainly, virtual meetings have been way more accessible for other people and in different ways, but it is unfortunately kind of a, a drawback for those, for many that experience brain injuries. Thank you. That, um, that's a really good point, right? With, the, with all of the screen work that we do. And it kind of lines up with another question that we had in um, how do we prepare our workspaces uh, for, for persons with disabilities? How do, how do we do that? Or brain injury or any disability? Well, I can talk to that a little bit. Um, lighting is one of the big things. And, and I actually, over the years, have seen people who work, uh, and I've worked for the state myself before, and um, workplaces are getting better about uh, putting more full spectrum lighting in, in spaces, but sometimes uh, people um, can have the lighting in if, if it's accessible to them uh, and there the lights um, kind of taken out of that space and they can put more ambient lighting in their workspace um, sometimes employers will let people do that uh, I've done that in my own office where well when we were at sale at office but um, and just changing the things that you think um, screen wise uh, sometimes I noticed that I was having a lot of problems with my my eyes um, and I you know it took me a long time to figure out that my screen I couldn't read um, when I was for long periods of time one of the things that people will get with brain injuries is is um, what they call neuro fatigue and that can also be when you're spending a lot of time on the screen and um, your brain works so much harder than you know, somebody without a brain injury to, to process. And our vision is, is a big part of that. Um, so um, I actually um, got a little bit bigger screen and, and um, that kind of helped. And then I realized when I went to my eye doctor and even my eye doctor was not sure how to help me. Um, I wear contact lenses and um, one of the, uh, things that I found when working with a specialist here when we did a screening year, uh, year and a half ago, maybe, I could not see binocularly. My, my eyes had learned not to work together. They were working separately. And you don't really understand that until they do these little tests. And I'm like, oh, okay. So my eyes were getting more fatigued. Um, so you have to kind of do this you gotta have to experiment with things. Um, my eye doctor thought he was helping me by doing something called monovision that kind of uncorrected, undercorrected one eye, over, you know, overcorrected so they would be forced to work together. It did not work for me. It was driving me crazy and I finally just fixed that. And so it's much better. You just, it's like, you just have to try different things. But um, Speaking of that, um, we had the Alaska Brain Injury Network come down and they had specialists that were, and Tristan kind of mentioned this before, occupational therapists, uh, speech pathologists, and they do so much, um, um, physical therapists. Balance is sometimes one of those really big things that people don't realize has been affected by their brain injury. Um, and you'll see people that are having more falls, 
and um, that happened to me also. I was like, oh, I'm just so much more clumsy, and my balance had been, um, physical therapy can really help you work on those things. Um, and I'm trying to hopefully get, um, you know, eventually um, Alaska Brain Injury Network was having people come, uh, a team come down um, to do these assessments. Um, and we'll hopefully see that again. But in the previous, or in the meantime, we can kind of work with people using a tool called the Ohio um, screening tool that has questions and give, it gives you a little history of, it gives people time to think about, oh, yeah, this happened to me. Um, and it's, it, it's a precursor to working with a specialist um, or a doctor to help you with that. Um, and I'm, I'm happy if people are concerned about maybe some things that we can administer the Ohio in our office as well. Um, let's see. And if, and if I can jump in, Tracy, really quick. Yeah. You know, I really appreciate the question about making our workplaces accessible for, for everyone. And I, and I meant to share this earlier, but I really just want to appreciate um, uh, NAMI Juno and, and the Suicide Prevention Coalition because they reached out at the beginning of this series and, says, and said, hey, how do we make sure we have closed captioning available on these mm -hmm. presentations we're doing? And I think I, I just really want to appreciate that because so often we don't think about accessibility for others until it's right there in our face. Um, and, you know, I, I know Juno is a, we're, you know, not a lot of great office spaces in this town and, um, but, but far too often we find ourselves in locations, we get cheap rent somewhere because it's up three flights of stairs and, um, but not only are you, uh, I mean, then it becomes inaccessible for somebody who can't navigate those stairs or, you know, I, I think about our, our workforce in Alaska and in our country is aging up and um, increasingly hearing and vision loss is going to become more and more of an issue. So how do you uh, work with a, in your phone, your, your business or your workplace phone system? Is that accessible for somebody who's hard of hearing um, and can't use uh, the normal headset? What's your alternative plan or how do people who um, are deaf or hard of hearing get a hold of you? Um, there are there are so many ways that we can think about how if somebody if we have written material presented how does somebody who is low vision or blind access this material um and it's and you know we don't know our blind spots per se until we're we're kind of challenged with them but um but we can always learn and, and do better and i will also offer sale like we are a resource in helping people brainstorm those solutions we it is absolutely a hat we wear and we we want our community to be accessible and inclusive of everyone, regardless of their disability. And so to that end, we also are happy to be a resource and a brainstorm. Um, and, and so we want people to reach out and say, hey, how, how can we be more accessible, more inclusive, both for our employees, but also for the public that we're serving? So I, I just I really appreciate the question. That's great. Now, are, are there fees for your services? How are there, do we have a sliding scale? What do we have? It depends, for the most part, no. Um, you know, we are fortunate sale. We have a diverse funding source from grants um, to some fee-for-service programs to, um, you know, a wealth of, of community uh, donor support. Um, for, to join like a support group, for example, there's, there's no cost to that. Um, our other programs like our taxi voucher program, um, if you meet the qualifications, there is, you get subsidized cab fare. It's 50 cents on the dollar and it's capped per month. So, um, uh, or if you, we, uh, we'll, we will go to somebody's house and do a, really a comprehensive survey of the home environment and how can they continue to age in their home, stay in the, in the place that they live. Um, there is a, a sliding fee for that. Um, but sometimes people just need, they need resources, they need a place to start. Um, and we, that at least through that front door, we want to be available. Um, and a lot of what we do, it, there is no charge. So um, we really want to make sure that people have the resources and supports they need. Thank you. Wow. 
Did I derail you? And all of our great questions that are coming in, did I derail you from some of what you wanted to cover for us today? I think we were starting to kind of route, wind down to the end here, actually. It's worked out great. Um, Do we want to share maybe some resources for folks that are, that are available to them? Yes, that would be fabulous. Well, actually, we, we do have, um, like we said, um, we have our brain injury support groups um, that are now meeting, they're meeting uh, via Zoom. But, um, you know, I would encourage people to call our office. And sometimes individually, I can just have a conversation with how to get started and um, how to connect people um, to the right resources. Um, like, you know, maybe we can, you know, work on filling out the Ohio screening tool um, and reference to um, Alaska Brain Injury Network, um, all the resources they have. And they also, um, you know, sometimes there are grants that are available um, to help people once um, there is a diagnosis and there might be some things that can help them. Um, uh, let's see, what else? Um, the other thing to think about also um, uh, for people who have a loved one that has, you know, um, an acquired brain injury or something um, that you need to advocate. If you can't advocate for yourself uh, with your medical provider, have that person that can come with you. Um, I like to use the phrase um, that we have in the past with working with fetal alcohol, and which is another type of brain injury um, as your, um, your outside brain. You're borrowing somebody else's brain to come in with you to help support you. Um, and working with a speech, physical and occupational therapist um, when they get a little bit more background. Um, what else am I missing there, Kristen? Um, our brain injury support groups meet, there's uh, two oh, yes. meeting times, um, the uh, second, tu second Tuesday of the month, am I right, Tracy? Mm -hmm. right, second, second, Tuesday, second Tuesday of the month uh, at noon for about an hour. Um, and then we also have the fourth Wednesday of the month. And we did that one a little later for people. That's 5.30 to 7. Um, and that sometimes is, is easier for people to get to that one. And like Tracy said, we are also sail ourselves for one-on-one -on -one kind of advocacy resources, helping navigate systems, get started. Um, the Alaska Brain Injury Network, uh, we've talked about them a little bit. They are uh, also a resource and they can certainly connect with if you or someone you know is looking for perhaps more intense rehab or recovery, they can help you figure out your options. It will likely involve, it may involve leaving the state for some time, um, but they, they can be a resource. They also will come down and travel throughout Alaska um, and do um, some screenings and, and the like to help people get started as well. Um, and so we can, if I, should I chat, like, should I put that stuff in the chat box? Is that what I should do? Or as far as sharing that information, what's the best way to get that out to whoever's watching here? I think- and I apologize you, that I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Um, I, oh, we can, it can be viewed on the full transcript. Um, okay. Yeah, apparently it can be. So when people replay it, they can hear that. But putting your website in is always great. Um, and and if you have any literature, we'll put your website and we'll put that on our Facebook. And um, so there we have it. We, we have it I'm going to chat comments. our website and then our phone number. And then this is the, the Alaska Brain Injury Network website That's as well. Cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you so much for doing that. You know, um, of course, the interest is in, in when people are in need to, to bring us together, um, you know, that is so that we can be our healthiest selves and, and promote wellness throughout our community. 
um, I want to thank you for all of the work that you do. I, I know that there is a tremendous group of people that are also interested in volunteering. Is there a capacity or or any other, uh, like what can my organization do to support your organization? Anything on that nature. Um, you know, if you can share that information with us, that is, that is going to be great. Um, so is there room for volunteers or? Yeah, I will say, you know, one area that, um, and it's, it's coming up and will look different. Our, our recreation program um, is always looking for volunteers, especially during the ski season. And we do, I mean, it's, we, um, it's cross disability. So anyone with a disability um, can participate in our ski program. And for, for some folks who have experienced um, a brain injury or experienced one, um, the sensation of sliding on snow can, can, even if they've skied before, doing it after a brain injury is like, I mean, it's totally different sensory perception. And so, um, you know, we, um, we definitely look for volunteers to help us get people back out on the slopes on the mountain. I will also say um, that in our support groups, um, and this is volunteering in a different way, but some people look at a support group and think, well, I, I'm in a place now where I, um, you know, I, I've, I, my life feels pretty back together or I'm in a place of stability. I don't know that I, I need support anymore. Um, and my response is, is always great. I think that's wonderful. And would you be willing to provide that support to somebody else? And, and maybe they're not in a place to do that, but if you feel like you are, there's always an opportunity in a support group to, to meet somebody else who is at a different stage of recovery and is, it could use that, hand or, or be that phone number to call or, or whatever is comfortable for you as far as lending that support. And I think that's a, that kind of peer support is just invaluable to the person you're able to provide it to. And I think that that really goes along with uh, what you were saying earlier about the structure of your organization as, um, and as we offer our services, nothing, nothing about us without us, right? So yeah, that's, that's always great. Well, I don't know if we have any other questions or if there's another point. I just, I have a million questions. You know, one of them is as a, as a grandmother, right? What is the best helmet and all of these other things? I, I let my granddaughter climb on the rocks at the glacier and was just mortified that she was going to have brain injury, you know, and uh, now I see that that might have been an error, right? So. And I think it's a great takeaway is that what are the things that we're doing in our lives, whether it's for fun, it's for work, um, what are the, in our communities where we can reduce the risk for brain injury and um, yeah, helmets are, helmets are a big one for sure. <laughs> now, I, and I think too, that one of the links that I'm making is um, that uh, I think with any change, but certainly with whenever we have um, a limitation, you know, change, limitation, you know, additional distress, mental distress on that, um, uh, not being able to remember, what have you, that, that can lead us to depression and anxiety. Uh, but is it also the, um, the, the, I guess, the organic nature, the physical nature of the brain that also can lead us to depression and anxiety as well? Am I understanding that both ways? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, that looks like um, that looks like we are are good to go. I think we've answered questions. I want to thank you one more time for coming and joining us, and I invite our viewers uh, to to check out the website for sale um, and bring your questions, you know, bring, bring your support and um, ah, what else do I want to say? I don't know if I have anything else to say. I have many other questions, but I will be checking you out online. Thanks for the invitation, Tina. It was great. Yes. Yeah, thank, thank you, you Tina. Ah, our absolute pleasure. Okay, well, I just have some housekeeping things and I wanna let our viewers know. First, I wanna thank our viewers as well for watching with us and remind you that we will, these, um, 
sessions that we're having. This series is being recorded. You can find it again on the uh, Juno Suicide Prevention uh, Facebook or JSPC Facebook, and it will also be downloaded at the end of the month on YouTube. Um, I want to let you know what's coming next week. We will have Clinkett and Haida Tribal Family and Youth Services uh, Education and Support Group. So that is going to be a very nice treat as well. We will have uh, mental youth mental health, uh, also teaching children mindfulness and encouraging co-regulation and connectedness uh, with their parents. We'll have art therapy and we will have some folks from AWARE. So again, want to thank you all for joining us. I look forward to seeing you again next week. And I, we might have lost our sunshine, but um, yeah, just want to encourage you to have a, a great weekend. Be safe, be well, and take care of each other. Goodness, Chief. Goodness, Chief. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.